Jerome and Sandra Harold were a loving couple from Stamford, Connecticut. They had one daughter named Susan and were a lovely family. Susan married quickly, eloping with her husband, and the once lively and bustling house was reduced to quietness. On October 24, 2003, the lonely couple became bored and paid $50,000 for a three-day-old chimp. They gave the chimp, named Travis, after Sandra's favorite country music performer, Travis Tritt, a place of residence with them. Travis was bathed, bottle-fed, dressed, and even had his teeth brushed by the couple. They adored the chimp and raised him as if he were their own child. He had given the home a fresh sense of direction and vitality and given the couple something to do after their daughter left. Travis embraced his human parents' ways as he grew, learning how to decipher their verbal and non-verbal communication. To accommodate the rapidly growing chimp, the couple had to restructure their They built a large room and hung swinging tires from ropes for Travis to play and explore. He was constantly swinging and jumping on the couch and bed while the couple ran other errands. Travis had a seat and a stemmed wine glass at the dinner table. He ate his meals with his family. The couple had lavished him with attention. Everyone in Stamford soon recognized him. Travis was held and waved at by neighbors and police officers whenever they saw him. His friendly demeanor won the hearts of the locals and he quickly became a local celebrity. He could dress himself, feed hay to the horses, use a key to open locked doors and water plants. To him, technology was a strange feat that he aspired to master. His passion for baseball had him mastering the art of watching TV with the remote control. The chimp could also boot and log into the family computer, where he could browse photos. He had an ice cream addiction that had him memorizing the days and times when the ice cream truck passed by the house. The couple returned to town in 2003 to replenish their supplies. They were stuck in traffic with Travis in the back seat with his window partially open when a person walking past threw an empty soda can into the car, striking Travis car. Travis unbuckled his seatbelt, locked the car door, and pursued the perpetrator. Travis, on the other hand, did not catch up with him. He then knuckled, walked to the tarmac, rolled on his stomach, and brought the traffic to a halt as the drivers and other locals were treated to a humorous chase. The traffic officers were forced to call for butter. Travis smiled as he skidded and jumped over cars to avoid the over a dozen police officers pursuing him. The chase lasted nearly two hours before Travis finally walked back into the car and buckled his seat there. This incident prompted Connecticut officials to pass legislation prohibiting residents from owning a pet primate weighing more than 50. Travis was fortunate to be exempt from the rule because the heralds had owned him for a long time and the authorities believed he posed no danger. Unfortunately, Jerome Herald died of stomach cancer in 2004, a year after this incident. This left Sandra and Travis, who considered Jerome to be his alpha. I was devastated. Sandra was depressed, so the house was shrouded in sadness once more. That, however, was not the only pressing issue. Officers from the Stanford Animal Control Department began knocking on her door soon after. Sandra's safety was a concern for the officers. Travis is moving into early childhood. He had now gained the strength of five muscular men. He was prone to aggression, particularly during his adolescence, which meant he would be difficult and dangerous to control. Animal control officers advised Sandra that keeping the chimp in the coming years was impractical. Sandra, who had never shown signs of aggression or violence, was unconcerned about her gun-wielding husband gripping her like a vice. Sandra fell into a deep depression, ceasing all social activities and communication. Travis, who spent his days eating snacks and watching TV, was profoundly affected by her unstable and vulnerable condition. She spent days sitting and rocking back and forth on her chair by their yard as she watched the sun set. He never left the house and did very little physical activity. Travis was horrifyingly obese. At Peps 240, his once gleaming face had turned black and wrinkled. His chest had gone from firm to flabby as hair loss took hold. Sandra picked up the phone and called her close friend Charla Nash on Sunday, February 15, 2009, inviting her to a lively conversation. Sandra and Charla had known each other for many years and she was a frequent visitor to the Herald's home. Travis was acquainted with Charla. After seeing her numerous times, after catching up, 
The two left Travis alone and went to the Mohican Sun Casino. They started at the salon and had their hair done before heading out to dinner. Afterward, before going home and entering the house, the two enjoyed gambling. An uneasy feeling arose. Sandra, on the other hand, Travis seemed uninterested in his favorite ice cream. She noticed Travis' TV and computer were both turned off, which was strange given how much he enjoyed his shows. Sandra mixed Xanax with the chimp tea before going to bed on February 16, 2009. Sandra awoke to find Travis romping aimlessly in the yard. She tried to summon him back into the house, but he ignored her. Something wasn't quite right. She called Charla right away and informed her of Travis's behavior. Charla jumped into her car and sped to Sandra's house to assist her in getting Travis back into the house. She alighted and chose Travis's favorite toy, a red Tickle Me Elmo, hoping it would be good bait to entice Travis back into the house. The pair went out to the yard, confident in their ability to handle Travis. However, upon seeing his favorite toy, Travis snapped as if driven by a strong desire to possess his favorite toy. Travis lunged forward, knocking Charla down. He then stood over her and with his massive jaws clamped, sunk his teeth into her face. Charla let out a terrifying scream that rang out throughout the neighborhood. Travis ripped her lips, nose, and eyelids off. Sandra snatched a shovel and smacked Travis several times, but he was unstoppable. He kept biting and attacking Charla, destroying her facial structure. Sandra screamed back into the house, grabbed a kitchen knife, and stormed out to assist her friend. Travis was so preoccupied with his rampage that he didn't notice Sandra charging at him with all her might. Sandra took a step back after inserting the knife into the chimp's back. Travis paused his mauling of Sharla and turned to face Sandra, his eyes wild with rage. He then shifted his attention to Charla and continued mauling her as if nothing had happened. Travis bit off Charla's left hand and Charla could hear her own bones snapping. She yelled at him. Travis, please hold. But Travis was in a frenzy, seeing Travis's ferocity and knowing she was going to be next. Sandra climbed into her car and shut all of the doors. Her hands were trembling and her heart was pounding in her chest as she fumbled for her phone and dialed 911. It was late and the chimp was killed by the police. My friend was acquainted with your acquaintance. I was used. What's the matter with your pal? I need to know when I acquired a firearm. They constantly read their faces off his face. Okay, I need you to relax a little bit. They've arrived. Can you hide yourself? I don't want to speak to you right now. I'm on my way, Mum. Is that the location? Fine. You've come with a friend. I require your assistance in assisting your friend. Can you go and assist your friend? I can't. He attempted to attack me again. Officer Frank Jeffrey, the first to respond to the 911 call, discovered Travis wandering around the yard while Sharla lay unconscious in tattered clothes covered in her own blood. Travis became enraged and circled the police car, looking for an open door. Officer Frank was terrified on the inside as the PES 240 chimp smashed the passenger window and unlocked the door. Travis was shot four times by the officer. The injured chimp staggered into the house, climbed into his bed and took his last breath. Charla underwent several surgeries in the months that followed to correct her distorted face.